this video we're discussing one of my favorite branches of statistics, non-parametric statistics. And we're looking at um, some generalities about the procedures that are available in this branch of stats. Um, first thing I want to do is maybe talk about uh, what non-parametric procedures involve. So let's look at this second bullet I've written here on the board. It says, do not rely, non-parametric procedures in other words, do not rely on many assumptions about the probability distribution of the sample population. So why is this important? Well, you know, what if you wanted to do some research about um, the reliability of your um, next automobile purchase? So you're thinking, well, you know, I want to buy a Honda, but I'm not sure if it's as reliable as Toyota, and I'm not sure maybe if the American makes now have caught up to those makes and are, are as reliable or more reliable. So maybe you want to go out and, you know, do a little sort of inference procedure to see um, whether you think you should buy, a, say, a Toyota, a Honda, or a Chevy. Well, you could go to Consumer Reports maybe and get some data um, that reflects, you know, reported, you know, repair times or something like that for the automobile you're interested in. But the one thing you might not know, even though you can get the data, and even though you may be able to accumulate lots of numbers, you wouldn't necessarily know how that data is distributed. You might wonder, well, gee, are these um, time to first repair numbers, for example, are they normally distributed? Because if they're not normally distributed, maybe a lot of the techniques you've learned earlier on in your course would not be applicable. So at that point, you're stuck. You're like, well, I don't know if it's normally distributed or not. Um, you know, you may or may not have learned ways to determine if data looks like it's normal or not in your earlier stats class, because that could that would be a problem. Even if you did learn those techniques that are available to figure out if data is normal or not, um, you may not have enough of data to be able to figure that out, because a lot of times those techniques require a certain sample size to be powerful enough to figure that out for you. So at that point, you're sort of stuck unless you have these procedures that don't really rely on that assumption of normality. So that's the real key powerful thing about them. That's what's really great about them. Of course, anything that um, you know has such a kind of open, seems like, well, gee, I don't need to know if something's normally distributed. I can just apply this set of techniques and get good results. Well, of course, there's got to be some trade-off, some consequence. The consequence is that essentially they're not as powerful as the parametric procedures that you would have learned earlier on in the course. When we say parametric procedures, we mean kind of the classic z-test, t-test type stuff, right? Those things that have the assumption of normality underneath, typically. So those tests are generally a little more powerful, sometimes a lot more powerful than the non-parametric things, depending on which non-parametric test you're using. On the other hand, some of the non-parametric tests are fairly powerful in their own right, and so you, know, you can get by with them. And one thing I want to emphasize here is that um, when it comes to something like rejecting the null hypothesis, that's really the issue when we talk about the power of the test. When we say a test is not as powerful, what we mean is that basically it has a harder time rejecting the null hypothesis. So remember, the null hypothesis is sort of the status quo opinion. You're often doing research to sort of challenge that or overthrow it. Well, you know, what happens when you have a weak test is it's more likely to let um, kind of the old guard stand, let it stay in place. So it becomes more difficult to reject the null hypothesis because your test isn't powerful enough to say for sure that it's wrong. Well, you know, when you end up with a, um, you know, a scenario where you're using a weak test, like a non-parametric test, but you're able to reject the null hypothesis, then you really don't have to worry about that criticism. So that's the most important thing, I guess, about this, is that if you use one of these non-parametric tests, you may be concerned about the fact that it's not powerful enough, but if you're able to, in the end, reject your null hypothesis, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Then you feel like, okay, it didn't matter that it was a weak test or a weaker test than I could have chosen. If it rejected your null hypothesis, then it did its job, it's fine, there's no criticism there that can be leveled at you. No one can say, oh, you didn't use a powerful test, so therefore the results aren't valid. That's not true. However, if you use a non-parametric test and you try to reject a null hypothesis and you're unable to reject it, and maybe you feel like it should have been rejected, that the data looked like it was strong enough to reject it, but somehow the test said that wasn't enough data to reject or overthrow the null hypothesis, at that point you might speculate as to whether or not using a parametric test would have made a difference, because a more powerful test might have been able to accomplish the task of rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, so enough about that. Let's talk about one last thing in this video, which is essentially um, one of the common skills that you need in these non-parametric procedures. It's very often that we have to rank data, so I just want to go over an example of ranking data here. So let's look at this problem here. It says rank the following data. So what we mean by ranking is we want to literally say what's the smallest number, what's the next smallest number, what's the largest number, so on and so forth. And the way we'll do that is we'll put a little number next to each value. The smallest number getting one, the next smallest number getting two, and so on and so forth. Now that sounds simple in and of itself, but there's an issue that comes up which is sometimes makes it more difficult, which is ties. What do you do when values are the same? Then you have the scenario where how do you know what number to give it for a rank, right? 
So let's do this problem here. And what I'm going to ask you to do is initially go through the data and just rank it, putting the smallest number as 1, the next smallest number as 2. And if you run across ties, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just do, you know, if, if two numbers are the same, you know, and they would have normally occupied the position 3 and 4, then just do 3 and 4 for the numbers like that. And we'll go back and figure out what to do with the ties right after that. So let's start with that first. So we're going to rank this data. Let's try to find the smallest number in the set. I see 1.9 is pretty small, so I'm going to go ahead and give that a 1, because I think that's the smallest number I see. The next number would have to be something in the 2s, well I see there's a 2.3, but then look, I see a bunch of 2.3s, right? So let's just call that first one 2, and then we'll call this one 3, and we'll call this one 4. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to circle these numbers. Just to indicate to myself that those aren't the actual final ranks because there's a tie, right? So I'm going to just circle them to remind me that there's something wrong with those I'll have to go back and fix. But then, okay, then we'll look down further. So that was my 2.3. Anything in the 3s? No. Anything in the 4s? No. Anything in the 5s? Yeah, there's a 5.8. I don't see any other 5s. So I'll give that the rank 5, right? Because we've used 1, 2, 3, 4, now 5. Okay, then anything in the 6s? Yeah, there's a couple of 6s here. 6.9, that would be the same. So I'm going to give that a 6 and a 7 rank. And again, I'm going to remind myself by doing something. I'm going to put squares this time, just to indicate that those are tied as well, but they're tied, you know, um, for different numbers, right? So a square, anything you want to use is fine. Just indicate that those are not the final ranks. And then finally, after that, we'll look for anything in the 7. That would give us rank 8. And then finally, rank 9, our ninth number. Now, what we want to do is make sure that our last rank at this phase of the problem is equal to our last, you know, or the number of values we had. Sorry. So we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So our last rank equals 9. That's what it's supposed to be. If we have 9 numbers, our last rank at this phase should be 9. Okay, good. Now once we've done that, let's take care of these ties now. So these would be the ranks if we didn't have ties, but we do have ties, so we've got to handle them. What we're going to do is we're going to say, look, it's not fair to give this 2.3 a 3 and this 2.3 a 4 and this one a 2, even though they're the same number, right? It's not fair to give that one a 4, this one a 3, and this one a 2, because they should all have the same rank, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to average the ranks that we gave them, essentially. So we gave 2.3 the rank 2, we gave it the rank 3, and we gave it the rank 4. So what I want you to do is add them together and then divide by the number of values you see. So 1, 2, 3. And if you do that, of course, you're going to get the answer 3. Uh, we can check that by saying 2 and 3 makes 5, plus 4 makes 9. 9 divided by 3, of course, is 3. So in that case, I'm going to change all of these to 3. So all of these are going to get the value 3. And what that means is I've now taken care of that issue, right? Let's do the same now for these guys, right? These guys. So the 6 and the 7. So again, we have two things tied. So we're going to add the 6 to the 7. And then we're going to divide it by 2 because there are two numbers. And of course, we'll get the answer 6 and a half then. So I'm going to change this to 6.5 and change this to 6.5. Now, every other number will remain the same. All the other ranks will remain the same. And now we have the set of ranks for these numbers. We've now ranked the full set of numbers. All the ranks are now provided. And that's a typical technique that we use in non-parametric procedures. We have to rank often, so that's an example of how it's done when you run across ties.